Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Expert Insights Webinars. I am your host, Don McLean, and today's session is focused on best practices for data visualization in pharma, presented by MMS. MMS is an innovation data-focused technology and technology-enabled CRO, bringing insights from our global team of highly respected data and regulatory experts across four continents. Here to present today is Dr. Eric Harvey and Chris Hurley. Based in North Carolina, Eric Harvey is Global Head of Biostatistics and Data Science at MMS. In addition to leading these teams, his day-to-day -day role at MMS involves working with and developing state-of-the-art technologies in data science and adaptive trial designs and risk management in data anonymization. As a leader in data science, he is passionate about data and collaborating to turn data into actionable information. Eric holds a doctorate from Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine, and previously he held leadership positions at PRA, Health Decisions, and Quintiles. Chris Hurley is Associate Director of Data Science at MMS and has been with the company for more than 10 years. In addition to partnering closely with Eric and others internally to develop the Data Science platform and achieve the data science goals for sponsors, Chris is also America's director at FUSE, a leading nonprofit global community of professionals passionate about the advancement of clinical information. Prior to MMS, Chris held a leadership role in statistical analysis and reporting at Pfizer. Thanks to our presenters for joining us today. As a reminder, your microphones will be muted for the duration of this session and we'll send out a recording following this call. And if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A during the presentation. We'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can at the conclusion. With that, I'll turn it over to Chris Hurley. Chris. Hey, thanks for that great introduction, Don. Uh, and thank you all for uh, attending our webinar here today. Uh, we hope it's informative and um, we hope uh, you enjoy the webinar. Um, we're gonna talk about some data visualization here. Um, and data visualization goes back over 200 years. William Playfair was a Scottish engineer, and he's credited with the development of the bar chart and the pie chart. So you can thank him every time you see a bar chart. Uh, very interesting. Shortly after he invented those things, um, uh, and to connect uh, to healthcare data visualization, Florence Nightingale, during the Crimean War, uh, she she developed her coxcomb or her rose diagrams to help visualize you know the poor sanitary conditions and um, document the malnutrition of the soldiers during that war so yeah uh, with florence nightingale uh, you know being so into data uh, and and helping these soldiers uh, uh, it it, it kind of reminded me of the story uh, of the charge of the light brigade because it was in the crimean war where that uh, that very famous poem came from. And with that, uh, the Alfred Tennyson poem inspired Iron Maiden's The Trooper. So we've connected healthcare, we've connected data, we've connected poetry and rock and roll right there for you guys. A great way to start this, uh, this presentation. So we're gonna talk a little bit today uh, about visualization tools and um, some of the best practices uh, for putting um, these tools in place. Uh, we're going to look at some use cases, uh, the data types that uh, are utilized most frequently with visualizations. Uh, we're going we're to look at some dashboard designs, and we're going to determine, you know, what you know to help determine what's in the the dashboards, uh, the best ways to to get that information through the process of discovery. We're going to put it all together, and then we're going to show. Um, uh, some examples of dashboards from our data size platform. We have a, uh, a platform uh, at MMS where we, uh, we utilize for uh, developing really nice visualizations. And Eric's going to show us uh, some examples uh, after the slideshow here. So moving on to visualization tools. Visualization provides a very quick and insightful way to look at data. We have on the slide here, you know, you've probably heard of most of these tools, you know, Power BI, Data Studio, and so forth. You know, there's other tools like uh, Spotfire and JReview that are used uh, in pharma a lot. Um, 
what what these do, what these offer, are a, a better way to look at data. You can you can interact with your data. Dashboards are very flexible in their design. Uh, with with most dashboards, um, there should be uh, a component where you can download the data, and we're going to show you some of that later. Um, you should be able to refresh your dashboards at regular intervals. So um, uh, there, there are, depending on your data sources, you, that's when you're going to determine, you know, at what intervals would I like to refresh my data. Um, and instant insights. When you look at a dashboard, almost immediately you should be able to tell, you know, what, what's, what's in that dashboard? What's important? What am I looking for? So that at a high level, this is what this is what we're looking for. So typical use cases, we we really want to get operational insights from our data when we're um, when when we're looking uh, at the efficiency of our clinical trials. So how how do we do that? We look at the EDC data, and and when I was talking about uh, the refresh rate or how often am I going to refresh the data, right? With that electronic data capture. Many of these systems, they enable you to either have an API, which is an application programming interface, uh, where you can actually drill into the EDC application and pull the data that you need for your dashboards. You can do this in real time. Um, there are also, uh, if if it's if real time is not really needed, there are other ways where you can you can export the data and you can send those data sets as XML files or uh, or other formats. Uh, to your application so you can read it that way. So you can actually directly link to the EDC or you can import data into your um, into your dashboard applications. So uh, when we do this, uh, it supports data management. And the nice thing about dashboards, um, you can develop the dashboards and with m many of these dashboards, you have, uh, uh, you know, ways to you know, filter and slice and, and grab the data that you need without having to wait for programming. Clinical programming, sometimes they're not available, right? Um, if you if you want to look at this data without waiting, develop some dashboards for the data that's important to you. And it's right there at a point and click at your fingertips. We also can develop dashboards and insights to uh, augment any reporting events like, you know, uh, DSMBs, DMCs, you know, where you may have typical TLGs that you that you provide to, you know, these these committees or to people reviewing your data, right? But sometimes in addition to those TLGs, it may be helpful to have dashboards so that they can link into the data and, and look and, and, and actually, you know, evaluate some of the data in real time themselves. So, um, uh, the 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 abilities that dashboards give uh, are so much more uh, interactive and flexible and um, uh, so so much better than your your standard static TLGs. So uh, we highly recommend looking into dashboards for visualizations. Another um, use case, and we presented a, a use case at the Fuse uh, Data uh, Data Science Innovation Challenge earlier this year. Um, when you're dealing with large data, uh, it, sometimes in order to, to understand your data, it's really, it's much better to visualize it. And so what we did was we took large post-marketing data sets, uh, structured data, and we, we, we developed a, a solution for uh, signal detection. And so uh, for through structured data, like the FAERS data, the Adverse Event Reporting System, um, we, we could develop uh, a, a little bit of a complex dashboard. Most dashboards are very simple in design. We had some um, uh, we had some algorithms in there that were very complicated, and um, uh, but 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 gave the answers uh, and and told us the relevancy of the signals. So uh, when you when you're developing dashboards, don't think that it has to be super simple, right? But that you can do almost anything with dashboards and visualize that data to give you those instant insights you need. We also uh, took a large uh, batch of unstructured data, including Twitter and Reddit data, and incorporated this data into dashboards so we could actually uh, uh, see if there were signals to come from uh, that Twitter data. So 
um, we did a lot of machine learning and and but but the end result we put this into visual dashboards where it was very easy for us to drill into the data, select the data, filter the data that was important so that our safety uh, our safety uh, experts could uh, could look at those signals and determine uh, quickly uh, and save a lot of time because of the dashboards. Instead of looking into every case, it led them into the cases that were most relevant. So uh, the use of dashboards, uh, I'm sure there are many other uses. These are just a, a couple a couple cases here where we might want to use those with Pharma data. Um, so uh, keep 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 your thoughts open and um, you know look for ways if you need data. Look for ways that you can get that through a dashboard. So we have different types of data in our dashboards. Typically, uh, you'll find qualitative data and quantitative data. And the qualitative data, um, uh, we, with standardization with CDISC, we have a lot of examples of this, like the CDISC codeless sex values, the female, male, unknown. Uh, this is qualitative data. This is nominal data where you have uh, these values that are totally unrelated to each other, only that they're related because they're collected in this uh, in the same uh, variable here. We have ordinal data where there is a there is some order to the data, but you really can't calculate a difference. But the data is there mild, moderate, severe, right? Um, so these are these are ripe for putting in dashboards and I'll show you some examples later. There's also interval data like this. These are scales with an order and differences matter like age and years. Right, but it's still the year is the interval. Um, so we can we can take that age and we can put that on a dashboard or we can group it and I'll show you. I'll show you some groupings and then there's ratio data where it's it's really a numeric and there's a zero value. Zero means something right pulse. If you don't have a, a pulse, it's zero. I think you're in trouble. Uh, and and um, and so forth. So uh, these are the the basically the four types of data you're going to find in dashboards. And uh, I'll show you some examples here. So uh, nominal data. I mentioned the sex values, female and male. It's it, this is the you know the the pie chart, right? So um, very simple. You can easily see the differences here when there's a small number of values. Um, with the bar chart on the right, we we can we can group ages. Like in this case, we grouped ages into intervals. So uh, very quick, you can see the differences between the groups. The ordinal data, where there is a, a an, an an order to these things, right? Um, you can see pretty much what the scale of the differences are, right? Mild, moderate, severe. And then I show some ratio data here. Um, this data we didn't have to show all of the, uh, you know, all the way down to the to the origin here, but we, we wanted to shade the area so you, the peaks and valleys were easy to see. So when you're designing dashboards, you know, the design sometimes you have a line chart, of, sometimes a scatter chart, you know, uh, sometimes you have a chart like this where you're going to fill all the way down to your axes to make things stand out again instant insights into your data so you can see the spikes you can see you can see the valleys when when you set up a visualization in the right way so what is it about design you know um you have to keep it simple and you want a consistent look and feel and i give an example here uh this is a, a dashboard in an airplane right front and center you have uh, what you have here is your um, your, your uh, the the, uh, uh, the the ball here that shows whether you're climbing or you're or you're descending or whether your wings are level, right? So you you look at this and uh, the tilt of the plane is going to show uh, the tilt on this. And one of the key things that you need to know, I need to know my airspeed, and I need to know how how high I'm flying. Right, and with these dashboards, what you'll have is you'll have this um, in the green. 
uh, it, it shows you need a specific airspeed to get into the air, say 60 miles an hour, 60 knots or, or so. Or so. Uh, if you go too fast, uh, that's not good because you start getting compressibility and, it, and it, it, it hinders the performance of, of, of the controls of your airplane. So with the, the horizon, with the airspeed, with the altitude, you can keep your, your plane flying in the right direction. And by the way, there's always a compass. You need to know where you're going. So any dashboard is going to have this. It's going to be right in front of the pilot, the co-pilot, uh, whomever. And it's always, it's always the same. So these always look the same so that no matter what plane you're in, you're not searching for these things. So you want to keep it simple. The same design standards that that they use, right, are the design standards that we want to use. When, when we develop a, a suite of dashboards, we want to keep it simple. We want to have the, the right information, the most important information, like this horizon indicator right in front of you so you understand what, you know, what it is that I need to know right now. And and then again, we can slice and dice, you know, later. So we'll put we will show you some um, filters and some things that we use, but but in, in able to order uh, in order to get the instant insights that we need. Now, dashboards need to be intuitive, so you need to know how to use these things, right? It's intuitive when you sit in a plane of pilot system. He knows where these things are, right? The, the important things. Uh, you have to fit it to one screen. You don't want to have to flip pages. Uh, that defeats the purpose, right? And also, uh, you don't want to mislead anybody with your dashboards. And I, I have an example of this later, but you have to pay attention to some things so that uh, you, you don't give results that 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 may skew, you know, skew somebody's understanding of, of the data that you're trying to present. Again, we want to keep it simple, right? Now, there's a rule of thumb here. Uh, seven, plus or minus two. Now, this works, and, and Eric was telling me earlier about phone numbers. People, in the old days, or early days, phone numbers were like five digits, and there was like uh, uh, some sort of mnemonic in front of it, like Pennsylvania 65,000 or something, right? So there's a, a number. People can generally remember up to seven numbers anything past that forget it uh it, you you're gonna you're not gonna remember so uh the the same rule that we use for phone numbers is the same rule that we'd like to use for dashboards and it's also the same rule when you probably had presentation training and they said you know no more than seven bullets or plus or minus two right so that's a really good number so try to keep Keep, keep that in mind when you're developing your dashboards. Uh, one, one example here is, is a good example, this uh, weekday server load example that I have. So it shows a good number of categories from, represented by the bars. It's seven plus or minus two. We've got five categories, right? But, and we're showing what the stakeholders want, but you know, what really could be improved here? So what what's, you know, is this too much, right? So when we look at this dashboard, you really, we're looking at it in 3D and there's some background and it's kind of hard to see, you know, these, the, these lines here, you know, keep it simple, clear off the background. If you want to show, you know, the, the lines at, at the numbers, you know, on the origin and, and throw those across, that's fine, you know, but do you have to be three dimensional, you know, go to two dimensions, make it real simple. And, and use different co the colors that you need to represent these things. So uh, these are these are simple things, very simple things to 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 pay attention to. So what we want to do, I mentioned we want to be intuitive, right? We want to fit to a single page. So when we look at this dashboard, and Eric's going to show you, he's going to show you this dashboard uh, from our data sites platform later. Um, what 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 is this that I mean immediately you can tell oh this is some sort of demography dashboard I mean intuitively how many patients do I have right I've got 106 patient screen 106 randomized great you know who's how many treated how many have completed right instant insights for your data right there uh, we have boxes Eric's going to show you how interactive this thing is but generally uh, the information that we want in the demo page, right? We want to just fit it together. There aren't very many visualizations here. 
Uh, there's more than seven, right? But of the important things, it, it's really, you've got these cards, you know, with 106, 101, 79, these cards, you've got these uh, a bar chart, a stack bar chart, a couple of pie charts, right? It's, it's very simple, it's very easy. You can, at a glance, know what's going on with, with the demography of your study here. So we talked about misleading results, right? Uh, you look at these two dashboards and without really taking a super careful look, you're looking at this and oh, it looks like the, you know, the, the dashboard on the left and the dashboard on the right, the dashboard on the left has higher values maybe, you know, dashboard on the right has more variance, you know, within the, you know, the, 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 the peaks and valleys are, are bigger. It's, uh, yeah, you know what, so you're looking at this, but but when you really take a look at this, look at the origin. The origin on the left is zero zero. The origin on the right is zero thirty. So we're starting the y-axis at thirty on the right. Therefore, it's pulling this down and skewing your results, right? And so, um, so whenever you have developed dashboards for for your sponsors or for yourselves, right? Have somebody take a look at it because maybe the person developing the dashboard maybe didn't understand the data or really uh, didn't understand, you know, maybe what the interpretation would be from the dashboards that are presented here. So you want somebody with expertise. Well, we at MMS, we always have a peer review. We, we QC everything before it goes out to a sponsor. So this, this would definitely be caught in a peer review, but uh, as it's being developed, you know, you, you you really should get some expertise in there. Have somebody look at that, at, you know, before you release anything for sure uh, to make sure you're not skewing any results. So effective visualizations come from a good process, right? You, in the data science methodology, data science, there's a period of discovery you have some engineering, you, you know, your ETL, extract, transform, you load your data. Maybe we're doing APIs from some database, right? You create your algorithms and analytics, right? You're, you're developing the things that are going into your dashboards, right? And then from those dashboards with those insights, uh, you can kind of, you, you, you share and, and you decide what to do with them. And it's always an iterative process because as soon as you understand one thing, then other questions pop up and you, you start going uh, through the problem solving process all over again, right? So uh, at, at the heart of the process is discovery. And at the heart of the discovery is really understanding your stakeholders. Who, who are the people that are going to be the audience to my dashboards, right? So um, it, it really behooves you to get the right people in the room and ask the right questions. What 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 really are the problems? What are what are the things that, you know, the gaps? You know, those things that you really need to, uh, to to derive into and get insights from your data. You know, where you're you're collecting all this data. What what's important to you? And how how you know how are we going to present this to you so that um, the important things stand out? And so uh, discovery and design and these principles all go into your prototypes. And when you're developing dashboards, it's different than developing like tables and, you know, figures, uh, table shelves where you have a, you know, you have a static table shell and it does this and that, right? These, these are all gonna work together and you're gonna want consistency across your dashboards so that it's very intuitive for your users. And so that the best way to do this is you prototype and and you work together as a team and you get the right dashboards together and then um, from there uh, you go forward and 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 you validate and you know you 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 know you produce the the production dashboards so there are challenges here uh, with validation especially uh, you know when when the the data uh, you know the data the data that comes out of your say your EDC system, right? It it may be different uh, in in scope and scale with the data that's in your dashboard system because remember, you don't need to have every field 
in your dashboard development that you have in your database development. So you might take the, you know, the, the five or six important fields, like maybe from your demography, and those are the fields that you're going to want to validate against your data sets. And so, um, so there are some challenges. And then any time you're within these dashboards, you're going to develop some custom algorithms. And those algorithms, again, those are going to be uh, creating things like study days or uh, you know, if you want to do a change from baseline, we had a, a chi-square algorithm for our data science challenge. Well, we had a double program that, and so we programmed it in one language. We were using R in that case, and then so we wanted to program it in another language. So there are uh, within the dashboard application uh, within within ours, we're using Power BI. Uh, DAX code. So we, we validated the DAX code against our code and compared the results. So it was true independent validation. You had a, a, a programmer programming in one system in a whole other language, then a programmer programming in another system in a whole other language. So uh, it presents its challenges, but then you know it's truly independent. It's not both based on SAS data, you know, like our typical validation would be for TLGs. So it's a it's a process, you guys, and and that process, you know, begins with discovery and understanding just what's needed to get those insights correct. So putting it all together, right? So, um, you know, the standardized data. If you think about SDTM and how our industry has moved forward, you know, uh, CDIS came out what 21 years ago or so, right? It took a long time to adopt to it, but uh, an SDTM data set now is just, uh, I mean, you take it for granted. Everything's going to be there. The information's there. It's in that way. I showed you a couple code lists, right? That that use of standards really made, you know, the use of that good standardized data uh, important and, uh, and relevant. If we use standards here for dashboards, it's going to make your dashboard, your suite of dashboards that much better because everything's going to seem to fit together and um, uh, and it's going to play nicely. You're going to you're going to be able to play with your data, uh, explore your data uh, in an intuitive way, and, and you're not fumbling around looking for things. So what what we've done is, um, and we have some examples, and I'm going to pass the ball over to Eric, uh, and he's going to show you some examples, um, including a blog a blog post that we. Uh, we just we just released a blog post on COVID-19 with an associated dashboard. So when this is all done, I really uh, I really think you guys would, would would like to go into that and play around with some of the numbers for for your states for wherever you're at. So Eric, I'm going to pass this over to you so you can show those dashboards. So um, so uh, take it away. Go ahead, Eric. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. So I'm, so I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and, and, and load up the dashboard. Up the dashboard. All right, so um, So as Chris mentioned, we have a platform we use at MMS called Data Size, and um, it has several capabilities. We're primarily looking at the data visualization capabilities here. And um, it has other capabilities, including data curation, advanced analytics, and, and other support for our data science group. So we have created around 20 standard SDTM dashboards. I'm going to show you a few of those here. And before anyone gets alarmed, I will say that this, this data we're sharing is fully anonymized. It's um, a demo we've prepared for, from a clinical study. So this, this will look a lot like other dashboards for SDTM data but the data contained is fully anonymized. So I'll just start here. Um, when we share this for production version, you won't see the border of the screen, so you'll just see this, this the dashboard itself. But for purposes of demo, um, we can look at the design principles represented here that Chris has shared with you. So as you can see, the filters are on the left and it's fully interactive. You'll see these boxes I can click on to filter by subjects treated, um, completed treatment, et cetera. And any one filter that you set 
um, filters for the whole dashboard, and I'll show you that in a minute. But just in terms of the visuals you see here, you do see a, a map that's fully interactive. You can see right away for this particular study, all the subjects are from the United States. Um, you can see pie charts representing gender and race. Um, often um, one of the goals for randomization is to um, get certain ratios of different categories of demographics represented within the subject population. So you can see that jump out right away at you. Same thing with age category represented in the bar chart. You can also see an example of probably um, not, not the best choice of visualization here in terms of a pie chart that has a lot of categories represented here. And the reason it's May, may not be the best choice in this case where we have a lot of categories is because the slices get very tiny and they get hard to see as you can get hard to see as you see here. Um, in terms of these numbers on the left, so they're hierarchical as Chris mentioned, moving from screening subjects all the way through through completed treatment. So we can see them all the way throughout the process. So I'm going to click on just one of these. Let's suppose we wanted to restrict this dashboard to just those subjects who completed treatment. We can do that with a single click and you can see, you know, the disposition categories are all now completed, but you can see that the map adjusted to show the distribution of subjects and demographics for, for those that completed. Um, so I'll move on to the inclusion exclusion dashboard. So again, this is an example of a bar chart, really the the idea being that the information you most want to see that's most important is towards the center of the screen or the top of the screen just because that's how our eyes are naturally trained to read and um, you can pick out real quickly here um, what what inclusion criteria exceptions were most common as well as exclusion criteria so that's very important when you're managing a study um, to determine what where you're losing subjects or why and if you look down here, there's a study arm filter as well. I wanted to point this out too because there's a blank here. Um, that's something very important to um, think about when you're looking at data quality, right? The data is not, not perfect. It's often never 100% clean. So we may have blanks and this study arm being blank may, means this is probably a patient who's not randomized at, at the current time. So again, um, the principles Chris talked about are represented here. Um, moving on to just a view of adverse events. Um, so again, you can see total AEs in the study, 1174. Um, the total subjects with, it, with AEs, um, 95. So a lot of AEs subjects had multiple AEs and that can happen. That's, that's one thing to keep in mind, the event count versus the patient count when you're doing clinical research. And we can zoom in, for example, over here, if we want to see, um, say, the all the, pa the two patients here who had an acute myocardial infarction. You can just click on it. It'll show you those two subject IDs. It'll zoom everything in. And of course, that's um, on the severe, moderate severe side. Um, and fortunately, no one died from either of those events. So to get out of that, you can just click again and it'll zoom back out. Um, we can filter by, say, those subjects that um, passed away during the study. Um, there should be six of those. We can see those six six subject IDs over here. So you're beginning to get the idea that this is very, um, very powerful, um, yet a simple way of looking at data. And it all starts with good design principles. Um, we have a lot of data available to display, as I'll show you some of these tabs just briefly. Um, it's key to work with those who are going to be the ultimate consumers of this data and these dashboards to make sure it displays what they're most interested in. So again, this is a findings about tab. Those of you who are familiar with CDISC will, will recognize this, but I just wanted to give it as a number example of um, some of the um, horizontal bar charts. We see the, the pie charts, et cetera. Um, so I also wanted to show you a lab dashboard. So this is another different kind of display. So right now it is selecting um, all hemoglobin test results. Um, for all subjects. So you look and you can see it gives you the normal reference range over here. You can right away see that there are some subjects um, that are probably below normal in terms of hemoglobin. So if you wanted to um, investigate further, you can actually use this query 
over here, which is kind of, I refer to it as Siri-like. Um, so you can use um, language like, um, oops, if I could spell correctly, <laughs> um, where AE decodes. Suppose we want to investigate. Hemoglobin is related to anemia um, for certain. So we can look at those patients that had anemia and look at their hemoglobin values. And if you look at the scale here, it's ranging from 60 to 120. So you can see the, the lower normal is 140. So in fact, all these, as we'd expect, all these patients with anemia have a low hemoglobin value, at least below the normal reference range. And you have their subject IDs and, and all of these you can filter by. So, um, so you can, can begin to um, ask and answer complex questions with these simple visualizations. Um, for concomitant meds, this is one um, often um, we see in clinical trials, and um, you can see, um, I can't, I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but I will, um, paracelicetol um, is the top concomitant med there. So that's, um, that may be of interest depending on study outcome. Um, one thing I wanted to show you on this visualization is this chart at the bottom here. So this is basically the height of the bar indicates the number of subjects that, that had that concomitant med, and the horizontal axis is the study day. So if you think the study starts on day zero, um, we also collect information before the trial uh, if they're still taking that medicine on before the trial and during the trial. So you can look back this direction and see that many of the, several of these patients were taking medications um, well before the start of the trial. So some of these could be data errors. So this is also a tool for, for data cleaning potentially. And the last example I wanted to show you here was just what a um, interactive listing might, might be. This is adverse event data. And the thing I like most about these are all, all of these columns are fully sortable um, so that you don't have to um, dig through your listings or present, um, perhaps generate multiple versions of listings. You can just um, zoom right in. And if you wanted to see everybody with an abdominal pain, we've just sorted alphabetically so you can see those subjects right here. So, um, I've shown you a lot of examples, lots of information here. Um, I refer to these dashboards sometimes jokingly as Excel on steroids, but I want to also um, mention some advanced features of, of dashboards and visualizations we haven't included um, here. So Chris mentioned earlier, we had some R code included in one of our data visualizations. I just wanted everybody to be aware that you can do things like machine learning, natural language processing, um, limited, um, image identification and processing. You can do all these within dashboards in real time. So these visualizations can get very complicated. You can do basically anything you can do in a programming language and visualizations. But the limiting factor as always, of course, is the appropriate data and the processing power and memory requirements. But in the era of cloud computing, that is very possible now. The other thing that's becoming very very prevalent in industry now is animated plots. Um, what I've showed you is a static plot of uh, basically it's what the events were at a given point in time, but animation can begin to show you how those events change over time. So that that's one trend in the industry currently. So I'm going to switch over now and show the COVID-19 dashboard that Chris alluded to. So this is something um, that's very apropos for all of us currently. I'm sure everybody is, is a little tired of hearing about COVID, but um, this is the dashboard that we generated to answer a couple questions. And again, um, I won't delve so deeply into the content as to the functionality, but at a high level, this is US only. So we built this to explore testing scenarios. So a, a number of us got together and um, brainstormed and one of the questions that kept coming up was it seems like um, the majority of the public feels that when you have a test result, it's 100% accurate. And this was a dashboard was developed in part to show that there are many things that affect the accuracy of a test. We cannot assume that a test for COVID is 100% accurate. And if you see in the lower right here, there are some performance characteristics of of tests that are marketed, popular tests that are being used every day. 
So, um, and then I'll walk through graphically some of the features here. So you can see that we have a state selector here. Um, and then this represents the population for the given territory selected. Um, and you can see the hierarchy principle Chris mentioned. So the within, um, per this data, we tested at this time about 8% of the population. Among those 8%, about 50 few percent re recovered, which is great. 43% um, still have active COVID, and unfortunately, 4% um, died. So you can begin to see um, by region. I'll just, I'm in North Carolina, so I'll deselect these and just select North Carolina. Um, and you can see how we have a little lower death rate in North Carolina than, than average, at least at the moment, though we have not tested um, as many percent of our population per this data. But you can see how these maps updated when I did that. Also, I wanted to show you um, back to all states. If you want to zoom out, um, you can see that you can make the graph larger very quickly. And the size of these dots represent the number of cases in that area. So you can begin to get an idea that the rates are higher in certain areas. This is um, prevalence among the, the tested individuals. And let me show you, suppose we want to match um, the AVID rapid test. So it, it has a predictive rate of about 85.2%. So, um, and you can see if we set the sensitivity of the test, and again, if, if you're not familiar with these terms, um, you can go to our blog, it describes them. Um, so if we set the sensitivity at 80%, the specificity at 91, and the prevalence at about 40, you can see our predicted value over here recalculated. It, it's 85.5%, which is a little different than um, the Abbott test operate published operating characteristics. But that's back to the idea that the test results are actually influenced by the operating characteristics, which are the sensitivity and specificity. But also what, what many people don't realize is the population, the actual population prevalence of COVID greatly affects the characteristics of the test. So you can see we have an 85% predictive value now. If I say that COVID was not as prevalent, like say I cut it in half from 40 to 20 in terms of prevalence, you can see the predictive value dropped um, down. And that that's just because um, there are fewer positives to identify there. Um, and if you can see down here too, the two most important parts of this, I think, are the false negative and false positive rates. So for every 100 people tested here, um, seven of them will be a false positive result. So obviously that can alarm people un unnecessarily. And also the false negative too. These are people who were actually positive, four out of 100 that were testing testing negative, but actually positive. So again, they're potential um, candidates to infect others, unfortunately. So I encourage you, um, we published the link for this, this blog, but um, in this dashboard, you can log on and, and play, play with it as, as much as you want. But again, the purpose really was to allow some simulation of scenarios, right? For, for those of us who are wondering about how different regions are doing. Um, we can, again, zoom in on any given state quickly. For example, MMS is headquartered in Michigan. So if we look at Michigan, um, unfortunately, they have a little little higher um, higher death rate. So, and again, these numbers are changing in time. So this we're looking at now is based on a data pool. So it, it updates um, daily as new numbers come in. And th this data in particular is based on results reported to the CDC. So with that, I'm going to um, stop demoing dashboards. I'll, I'll let Chris um, go back to the slides and we'll close out and open up for questions. Great. Um, let me get back to the slideshow here. Yeah, thanks, Eric. That was an excellent, excellent demonstration of our dashboards. And you could see everybody that dashboards were very flexible and, and we're doing simulations and all kinds of neat stuff with COVID uh, right there on a dashboard. You don't need a programmer, right? Um, so if you just understand a little bit about what the data is, you know, learn learn about the dashboard. Sometimes the dashboards take a little training. They're not completely intuitive when they get to a, 
uh, a level of complexity like this one. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's just an excellent example. So what we've covered today, basically uh, understanding what you need through the, the discovery process, getting the right people involved, especially the stakeholders that are going to be using those dashboards, some different types of data that go into those, and then especially the design standards so that the dashboards, they really work for you. So I think with that, uh, I think we'll close it out. And I think Don is going to facilitate the questions. Any uh, yes. questions? Yes, thank you, Chris. And, and thank you, Eric, uh, so much for both of your insights. Uh, it's truly appreciated. Um, we would like to move on to the Q&A portion of this webinar. Uh, so if you have any um, additional questions, please go ahead and enter them into the live event Q&A right now. Um, there should be a section at the top right of your screen to be able to include those. Um, Chris, we do have one initial question for you here. Um, what data visualizations are used in typical study or submissions? So typically in submissions, it's it's generally it's TLGs, right? There's a lot, you know, uh, a lot that we submit. You know, there could be many graphics uh, that are submitted. As far as dashboards go, um, uh, what we at MMS we have we have a dashboard that we use for gap analysis for understanding what what documents and things go into that submission, so that we have like an inventory of everything that's needed. Um, and that's a creative use of, uh, of design uh, to understand uh, and make that process more efficient. Uh, as far as dashboards uh, being utilized within submissions, uh, it's not very common. Uh, I, I, I can't think of any that are submitted along with submissions, but I know that um, with the 21st Century Cures Act a few years ago, with all that we're doing with real world data, uh, as the as we begin to use more and more uh, uh, data from various sources, unstructured sources like Twitter and, and things, um, I, I can see that dashboards will, in the future, generally you you may have uh, you may be submitting data and not TLGs, uh, data and dashboards maybe. So uh, the future I think uh, is along these lines of data science and, and utilizing dashboards. So uh, though it's not prevalent now, I can see that uh, in the future it's going to be a part of submissions, I'm sure. Thanks, Chris. And, and a follow up question in regards to that, in regards to the level of difficulty in learning these tools, um, is it difficult to jump from static uh, TLFs to these interactive type dashboards? Yeah, I think um, I think it, do, it it's just it's a it's a different type of mindset. I want to look at this data visually, right? And so when when you have all these static data, you have all these static great. Like I I was on a, a study some years ago. Uh, we did hundreds of graphs, spaghetti plots of every type. We sliced and diced the data, and oh my gosh, it was it was terrible in that. It was hard to find all those. You know, we had 150 different graphs. You know, across five five populations, and 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 so yeah, yeah, almost had to you know dig for this, and then and then it took time to load. Well, if you can if you can get all past that and use a dashboard, you can start sl slicing. You know, we we showed you there was different um, uh, populations, right? Uh, different analysis. Uh, uh, populations. You just click a button on a dashboard, and it just re it, it redisplays with with those desired uh, patients. So, yeah, the difficulty is just understanding what is it that I need, and and developing it, and just what insights do I need. So that all goes back to discovery. When you're if you have something complicated, you know you're going to have all these groups. You're pooling data, perhaps, you know. You should really look into using dashboards, and and so you can truly understand your data. Yeah. Wonderful, thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so if there's no other questions, um, I'd just like to remind the audience that if you'd like to try our COVID-19 testing dashboard uh, with DataSize, you can visit mmsholdings.com and navigate to our latest blog article. Um, and if you'd like to sign up to for to listen into additional webinars, 
um, you can visit mmsholdings.com slash webinars. And then lastly, if you have any additional questions in regards to what you heard here today, um, please follow up with directly with your point of contact with MMS or email media at mmsholdings.com just as you see on the screen and we'll direct you to one of the presenters. All right, thank you very much for listening, everyone. Uh, thanks again to Eric and Chris for presenting and have a wonderful day. Thank you.